What was your most intense hunting trip? We ended up finding animals, um, immediately put a, a tar down, had to go up, try to pluck that tar off the mountain. We got to where it was. It just happened to, you know, I, I shot it, it supermaned off and just dove down into this snowfield. Oh my gosh. And that darn snowfield had a big, like 200 foot drop right below it. All right, what is up everybody? And welcome to the live Q&A in the Vortex booth at the Western Hunting Conservation Expo. This is Mark on the mic. I am joined by the Ryan Lampers. I like to call you the Ryan Lampers. It sounds super official. I don't know if I'm comfortable with that, honestly, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm comfortable with it. And that's what matters. It's not about you, Ryan. It's, it's about me. So mm. yeah, we're doing a live Q&A. We're answering everybody's deepest darkest hunting questions here and we actually we have everything from uh, we got some serious ones we got some technical ones and we got some fun light-hearted ones here so we mm. got a good mix so like like eric said earlier we got a grip of questions here and we're gonna we're gonna perfect we're gonna pepper you with them and talk about them uh for the next you know hour or so do here. i need to answer them with your enthusiasm that you got going on right now you do it's pretty intense or you can plead the fifth okay. you do have that option <laughs> okay. so uh we're gonna come out of the gate hot here ryan mm. and this is uh so this is this question comes from Levi Hunter at 208, at 208 underscore hunters. 208. Underscore this one came in from Instagram. This is this okay. is one that you and I debate quite a bit, actually. Mm. I'd say uh, sometimes it lights, it's light hard. Sometimes it actually is a little more serious. Uh, <laughs> mule deer or white mule tail? Deer. Interesting. Why is that? This is a, what a silly question. I mean, serious. You feel like you don't even have to explain yourself. No, I really don't. Um, so we're going to go into all the many whys. It, it's a uh, mule deer. Oh yeah. We're going to, we're going to go tail. into it. Well, I apologize vortex nation because, um, this might hurt some feelers out there. I know there's a lot of white tail guys, but, uh, every chance I get, every opportunity I get to uh, make fun of guys that chase white tail, Mark, you know, this, I take it right. I, so I do, it's I, almost too easy of a target for me it actually it's so i'm not gonna it's you know it's funny it hurts it hurts the same every time that you do it <laughs> so i know you love mule deer here's what here's what yeah. i'll say L let me uh, let me interject here so i'm we're both from washington state mm -hmm. i'm from as far west as it gets right we both are yeah i grew up hunting black tailed deer yeah. right so that's probably the deer that's closest to my heart in a lot of ways it's what i grew up hunting and i like to think of them as um like a sophisticated mule deer Okay. And then and then you have white Ooh, tails. That hurts a little. And then and then mule deer. But I mean, I know you love mule deer. Everybody <laughs> loves mule deer. I mean, yes. we uh, actually even around vortex we describe them as the king of deer. Even we live in the heart of white tail country. We chase white tails very passionately as well. But I love like, the king of deers. That sounds about about right. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what what are the things? What are the attributes of them? Is it the place? Is it just how they act? Is it what they do? Mm -hmm. Is it how they look? Is it all those things? Like what about mule deer? Yeah. Like captured your heart. Okay. So. I think it's a pretty easy thing to answer, um, and it sounds cliche, I guess, when I say it, but uh, it's kind of where they take you, like where you end up when trying to locate and lock down a big old muley buck. Just something about those places. Um, you know, cornfields, Mark, um, lowland country, easy walking, no elevation. Man, that just does not excite me. Sitting in a tree stand all day. What's exciting about that? Oh, my. Versus, let's go grab 5,000 feet of elevation, grab a perch, see a buck, do whatever it takes to get there, spend a day or two trying to get there, and, uh, and try to lock that buck up. Or we could sit in a cornfield, up in a stand or in a blind, and just sit there and wait. They're both fantastic. Now, I'll say this. I think you've been watching a little too much outdoor hunting television mm. because we do need, we need to get you, maybe this will be, this will be like a, like a social hunting experiment, but we'll get you, we'll get you in some good Wisconsin hill country, yep. some public land. We're going to come in hot. We're going to look okay. at, we're going to look at our digital mapping programs. We're going to drop pins on pinch points and saddles, mm. try and figure this stuff out. We'll go in, we'll read some sign. We'll do some hanging hunts. We'll get you in a tree. Mm. And and then you wait. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you lost me right there. Uh, no, I think, um, you know, a lot of it has to do, I mean, 
Where I started, you and I started, like you said, in blacktail country. Now, my first deer wasn't a blacktail. You almost expect it to be from where we were, blacktail all over the place. But my first deer was a mule deer. It was. And um, my dad brought me up, kind of mentored me. Uh, I think I was 14 when I killed that first buck. Uh, back in the back in those days, it was a lot of like bird hunting and stuff like that. Whereas big game wasn't at the top of the heap like it is now for us. But uh, yeah, it was a it was a that first trip kind of set the stage. It was a wilderness trip, uh, Washington State high country had all the things. It had the snow. Uh, it had me going off by myself. I have no idea why my dad let me do that. Um, I ended up killing a four point on my first. Uh, first ever kill it was uh one of those deals where i saw it tracked it down took me into a deep dark basin that um i was very inexperienced with navigating anything i mean this and is this is lost. pre and i was gonna I say lost. yeah this is not this is like this isn't gps time no, this no. isn't you know storm on X or digital pit mapping yep storm rolled in i thought i could get myself out of there by taking a little shortcut well that shortcut turned into a like eight hours the wrong direction not completely the wrong direction, but for the most part, the wrong direction. Uh, ran into a drop camp, a couple of guys, in the middle of the storm. And they gave me some directions. They gave me a little mag light and, uh, and some food because I had nothing on me. And they told me where I was and let me go. They wanted to keep me at, this, at the wall tent that they had, uh, had dropped in there, but... I knew my dad was going to be looking for me. So I ended up getting out of there. It was like 1, 2 in the morning or something like that that next day. But I think how hard that hunt was, it was really memorable, even though, you know, maybe maybe I could have been like, well, screw this. I'm never doing this again. This was ridiculous. almost died. But, no, it kind of set the stage for uh, that was something I wanted to do forever. It put me in probably the most picturesque little basin ever. Took that four point, and the hooks were set. Yeah, I think that says a lot about you and your personality, even as a youth. Like, like you almost alluded to, like, that could have gone either way for, you know, a lot of people. Like, man, I'm never doing that again. That was absolutely frightening. Like you said, I, I mean, realistically, that could have gone south and Real gone the other quickly. way very easily. But you, you're like, oh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm hooked. Yeah, I yeah. want. And, and you really haven't Loved stopped. It. That's kind of been your style of hunting mm-hmm. from there forward. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. Um, yeah. To, to have my father, you know, when I have no skills, just let me go off, traipse through big <laughs> storm, you know, foot to a foot and a half up on the rims of snow. Uh, no experience, very minimal gear. Um, I'm glad he did it. I mean, yeah, super lucky to get out of there. I think if I would have been 20 feet one way, I would have never seen that tent and that white out snowstorm, but happened to run into those guys. So guess it was meant for me to get out of there I, I guess so well, I'm glad you're sitting here today let's uh we'll go on to number two. Oh, this is a good one you chase a lot of critters you knock a lot of critters down do you have a favorite wild game recipe that's kind of like what's your favorite hunt of all time there's so many um I think if I'm just you know thinking about what we eat the most uh we we do a lot of our own dehydrated meals now mm-hmm. and freeze-dried meals for the hunts so a lot of the game that we take uh, in the fall ends up going to meals we make for the next fall. And, um, you know, I make a lot of really easy dishes like vegetable curry bear meat. One of my favorites. Um, oh, you can eat with, bears? With rice and or quinoa, you can eat bears. <laughs> that was sarcasm, really by the good. way. Um, yeah, I know. I was just talking to a guy, and, and uh, I was telling him about a bear hunt. And he said, what do you do with those darn things? And I was like, well, we eat them. They're, they're really good. <laughs> Trust me, they're really good. And I know a lot of people um, have heard for years that they're not, but, no, they're some of the best. But, yeah, um, I just like those simple dishes, honestly. It's uh, making making those, whether it's just like a spaghetti, um, bear meat. I bring up bear meat all the time because I just love putting bear meat in all those meals. Uh, but real simple, like a quinoa, veggie, meat, curry dish. Yeah. Probably my favorite. And that's awesome, too. Like, there's there's something incredibly satisfying about having, you know, some, some meat from the year before, whether it's something a little bit more elaborate, like what you're doing, or even just some summer sausage that you had make, made up and you carry it with you on the hunt. And, you're, you know, you, you might even be eating that 
animal on the same mountain that you took it on oh, yeah. before. Yep. And there's just I, there's just something uh, meaningful. You can reflect on that. It's very it's just like super satisfying to kind of like, Absolutely. I guess, you know, bridge those two things together. So Yeah. Yeah. And you could take it even further if you're a gardener um, because we like to do a bunch of gardening. So we take a lot of those vegetables. We add that to the meat. And then we've got this whole meal that we kind of self-made. But, um, yeah, that's probably one of them. Now, go back to bear meat. It's hard to beat just a good old-fashioned, you know, bear steak on the Traeger. Okay. That's, I don't know, that's some of my favorites. Real simple. Um, I mean, you can't really go wrong if you get a, like, from our old state, Washington, one of those fall berry-fed bears. Mm -hmm. How do you beat that meat? It's just, it's just too good. It is, man. It is. I'm hoping to hit that high country here. Man, I don't know if I'm going to get there this fall or not, but, like, mm. I, man, I sure think about it every mm -hmm. fall, though. Mm -hmm. Yep. We, we, we came close the last time I was there. It's one of the highlights of Washington State is how good its bear hunting is in the fall up mm -hmm. in those uh, that high country. Yep. Ton of fun. Nope. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. All right. Uh, all right. Well, here, uh, asking for a friend, actually, uh, all right, Ryan, uh, full disclosure, this is my question. Uh, where do elk go midday in thick country, mm -hmm. and then how can you find and kill them if they're not talking? Mm, that's a tough one, isn't it? Um, so typically in those scenarios when we're hunting thick, like I'm thinking right now of like places like North Idaho, where yep. I kind of you know cut my teeth on that chasing elk, calling elk, um, trying to get pick bites with big bulls. That country is very wooded very there's not a whole lot of openness to it so oftentimes you're kind of reading the topography looking for benches benches on north slopes especially uh inevitably when you do end up getting that squeal or you know that midday nap bowl that just gives you a sound it ends up being on a bench so you can kind of expect if, it, if you know you got elk in the area to kind of read your your topo lines and and um, find out where those benches are on those north, north slopes um, that's been pretty effective for me. And inevitably, if you've, if you've been hunting elk for a while and you think back as to where those bulls are typically calling from midday, it's either on a kind of a flattened ridge or some type of a more of a flat bench on the mountain itself. Gotcha. And I, I'd assume that's just like a spot where they want to be. They can, mm -hmm. they can bed down. It's a little bit more, uh, I guess, conducive just to being comfortable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You'll find that elk typically don't bend in, bed, uh, bed up in really, really, really steep stuff. Mule deer will. They're king of the mountain. They'll do anything <laughs> to get away from us. But elk tend to find a little bit more of a soft spot. Gotcha. Gotcha. I like it. Um, okay. Well, this, this, this one might be a tough question to answer. What's the most challenging animal to hunt in your experience? Giant mule deer. Giant mule deer, like yeah. looking for a big one. Yeah, mature mule deer. Now, obviously, you know, you, you find two, three, four-year-old bucks. Um, yeah, they're not going to be the hardest, but when you're looking at a true, like, real mature, I'd say over five years, you know, six, seven, those bucks, uh, to find, to locate, to be able to hunt those true monarchs, um, that's probably one of the hardest feats, I think. I've just noticed they can be really, really difficult to locate. Um, they're like me. They're like introverts. They just don't want to be around folks, and there's a lot of folks bebopping around the mountains these days. So, uh, in my opinion, um, now I don't know about whitetail, but I, I can say uh, old age class muley bucks are probably the most difficult yeah yeah white tails are harder um do you think do you think and is that is that a factor of that there's just not that many like they just aren't there for you or are they just are they doing different things like you said they're smarter they're more reclusive they're just not going to reveal themselves i think yeah a combo of both it's really hard for a for a muley in the country they live in to not get chewed up by cats number mm -hmm. one because they're they're off by themselves. They stay up high on the hill. A lot of them don't come down all the way to those flats, you know, for winter range and stuff. And the cats, yeah, they do pretty well on those old mature muley bucks. But I think it's that. And um, just like you said, the seclusion that they, they're comfortable in, they just stay off the beaten paths. They have a way of not being seen. They just hang in that country where... Um, and it's, it's some of my favorite country to hunt is those areas where there's a real low density. You're not seeing a lot of deer. 
you're looking for one deer maybe um you might only see a um i'm thinking of some areas in in like western montana you may only see one halfway decent buck in an, in four or five days of hunting if you're lucky um but oftentimes those will be the real good mature bucks older age class so i would say that has a lot to do with it they just they just want to be off by themselves yep i'd imagine going into an area like that where you're talking about where you've got low density but you know potential for finding you know one of those older bucks mm. you probably have to shift your mindset and your expectations a little bit and go into that knowing like hey this is going to be tough. Yep. I'm not going to see a lot of deer. So not letting, not seeing deer get you down or get you discouraged. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think most people, um, me included for most of my hunting career, I think when you're not seeing bucks for multiple days in a row, it's pretty easy to lose focus and want to go somewhere where you are seeing a lot of deer, um, where it just doesn't feel like a needle in a haystack, you know, mission impossible. So uh, I think that tends to drive a lot of hunters away from those areas where there's real quality bucks. Um, but in the end, if you're willing to stay up there, see very few deer, few bucks, and play the patience game, I mean, it does take an incredible amount of patience, something that I didn't have in my 20s and probably early 30s. It took a long time of figuring out, like, this is what it's going to take to be able to stick it out, be diligent, and... Um, you know, spend as much time as it takes to, to locate one. So I bet it is extremely satisfying when you do locate that one. And I mean, it's just really like any hunt where you grind it out, grind it out, grind it out, man. When it, it when it finally pays off, like it is, I mean, oh, it, yeah. it's the sweetest thing Best for sure. in the world. Yeah. Maybe I'll field this one. How do you use the dead hold BDC reticle? Which mm. that's so that's a that's a you know a common reticle. You'll see variants of BDC style reticles. If if you don't know what those uh, that acronym is, it's ballistic drop compensation reticle. So it's going to be uh, you know essentially on the uh, vertical stadia. You're going to have a series of marked drop references. I know you've used this reticle a lot, Ryan. But uh, I don't know it was an optics question, so I was like figured I'd jump in. But uh, you know essentially those drops are going to subtend with a general ballistics curve, right? So on, you know, f for example, for your common big game calibers, you know, your 30-06s, your, your, your 270s, you know, our, our guys have kind of gone and crunched a lot of numbers and come up with a general ballistics curve that are going to drop uh, and subtend with those references in the reticle. So you'd, you'd sight in that rifle, you know, your center crosshair is going to be at 100, then your first drop reference is going to be two, three, four. And then if you get a range and it's kind of in between, it's designed to get you in the kill zone. It's not going to be as accurate as a reticle that maybe subtends in, in mills or MOAs, where if you've gone through the process of getting your ballistic data, I mean, you can hold, hey, I want to hold three MOA, perfect, right. you know, or, or whatever those, whatever that happens to be. But that's, that's the general uh, way you'd use it. And then you can kind of go and extrapolate that and be like, okay, I'm shooting a hotter cartridge, you know, so that's going to go and subtend a little bit different. You might be shooting a varmint cartridge that's going to subtend a little bit different. Actually, the instruction manual in the box for our scopes is going to have that information. So if a person has that scope, they can look that up and that's going to get them in the ballpark. We always recommend that's a starting point. Go out to the range, shoot your gun, the load that you plan on pushing through your rifle at those distances and figure out exactly where they're hitting for you. And you're going to have way more confidence when you hit the field than having to, you know, maybe guess a little bit. So Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, we kind of just covered this, but maybe there's an, another nugget that we can throw in there. This uh, uh, um, Spencer Curtis says, what do I look for when trying to find big mule deer? So what are, what are some other things that a person might look for that be like, whether it's a, a terrain feature or a place or what should, uh, what should, what, what should Spencer look for? Yeah, that's a tough one because um, kind of like we just went over with the general area, um, it's really hard to pick out a, a, a feature like a bench for an elk or, uh, I don't know. What would a whitetail be? A bucket of corn, I guess. <laughs> that's, that, that's the feature they <laughs> come gonna, to. You're going to get um, some hot water here. Oh, man. Um, yeah, features for muleys. I mean, it's, uh, you know, kind of the things that we look for when we're looking at a new state or a new, completely new range or new area. 
as always, it sounds cliche again, is, is uh, looking for areas with the least amount of boot traffic, looking for areas where they're unmolested. And then um, we're basically trying to find those low density areas where people are most apt to not focus their time there. Kind of like I talked about before. Mm-hmm. Um, we love those areas. You typically don't find boot tracks in places where guys are seeing a deer every few days. So we look at those areas. As far as features go, it's really hard to just focus on one because you'll find muleys bedded up in rocks. You'll find muleys bedded on steep timbered shoots, um, av shoots, down in the bottoms. Um, I've seen them top to bottom. So uh, it's just really good glass, spending a lot of time um, and being really diligent. But uh, kind of the things that we're always looking for picking out those new areas trying to find a a mature buck is areas of least with the least traffic unmolested deer much easier to hunt than um than areas where there's just a lot of people looking at them so yeah it sounds like you're looking for areas with low densities Mm -hmm. not a lot of hunters probably because there's low density of deers uh, deers and uh uh that's plural by the way and then uh and then you're putting on a lot of your own boot traffic yeah Yep, yep. That is the recipe for success. Hmm. Well, this is this this is a good one. This comes from uh, Ethan Johnson, Ethan underscore dot Johnson one. And this is we're gonna kick the old cartridge hornet's nest here a little bit. Okay. Best long range caliber. <laughs> oh man, I'm not the guy to to ask that question for. Um, it, it's probably better fielded by you. I mean. I can say I grew up shooting my 300 win, right? Mm-hmm. Had a lot of buddies that shot a, you know, the 300 wisdom, and that was fantastic. Right now, I'm shooting a 6.5 a lot, uh, 6.5 RPM, mm-hmm. like a 6.5 PRC, very similar in ballistics and all that jazz. And that's kind of what I'm stuck on right now. But um, I don't know. You might have a better answer. I've I've been real happy with everything surrounding that 6.5 RPM. That's, I mean, that's a, that's a great cartridge, and it is funny because, like, you know, when we came out with the new Razor HD LHTs, and, you know, you've got the pop-up and down locking turret, the Revistop Zero system, uh, you know, you, you've got the, the reticle in there. I mean, the whole thing is, I mean, it's a lightweight, compact yeah. rifle scope, fully featured top tier for long-range precision at the same time. And um, you had it, and you went on this fantastic hunt and i'm like oh you know tell me about the hunt and you're like yeah and then i shot this one at 50 yards and then i shot this one at 100 yards <laughs> i'm like boy you're really stretching that thing's legs a little bit but uh no i mean yeah the 6.5 prcs the 6.5 rpms they're great i've always been you know everybody likes what they shoot you know what i mean yep. it's kind of uh i think that's natural i've been a fan of the 300 wisdom 300 you know wsm that's a great all-around killing stick cartridge for me it's great for some long-range stuff just just a good do-all uh, 28 Nosler is, is pretty cool. Yep. Uh, I'm kind of digging that cartridge as of lately, but, uh, just the, the, the increased interest and in the development from rifle companies and then cartridge companies, uh, in the last really 10 years has been astronomical. There's just so many good choices out there. Some, some are more you know, I guess, you know, commercially viable, you know, they've caught on more than some others that haven't, but some of those others that haven't are still fantastic cartridges. You got the, the seven Psalm out there. That's a great cartridge. But I was even debating that with our own Ryan Muckenhern the other day. And that's not too far off from the 280 AI, which has mm-hmm. been around for a while, you mm-hmm. know, so it's yeah. kind of a, a lot of the, some of the one. stuff is, you know, what's what once was old is new again and vice versa. So there's a lot of great options out there. And, and there's no question the options are better than ever. The ammo is better than ever. Rifles are more accurate than ever. Optics are more accurate. You got range finders, ballistic calculators. I mean, if you ever... It really is hard to go wrong right it, now. It is yeah. hard to go wrong. We are. I feel like we're in a, a renaissance of, mm-hmm. of long range right now. Yeah. And, you know, we're, like you said before, right now I've been playing around with that uh, 6.5. Basically, it's like a PRC. And, uh, you know, we're not taking the longest shots. Um, I don't know why. We just always try to get to that 300 range, and uh, usually it tends to work out. So um, I don't have any deer over, I think, the farthest uh, mule deer I've ever taken. Was it 350 Okay. now um, after this year? So Or 360, and that was the farthest one. I've taken animals 
coyotes, stuff like that, much farther. But as far as mule deer go, um, and any other big game animal, it's always been sub 400. You're too much of a wolf. Yeah. I don't know. It's just fun getting in tight, somewhat tight. Evan Abate, Evan, if I, if I butchered your name, please forgive me. Uh, Evan Abate, five tw- uh, at Evan Abate 529 asks, and this is, again, we're kicking the cartridge corner's nest here a little bit, uh, 7M Meg mm-hmm. or 300 WSM. So if you were given <laughs> those two options, Ryan, what are you taking? I'd go with the Wisdom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree. I concur. Just, I have a history with it, and it's, it's good. It's hard to beat. I agree. I've shot most of the critters that I've killed with the 300 Wisdom, and it always seems to work quite well. Um, this is a good one, you know, and I think, uh, you know, we're talking fall bears again, I guess specifically for Colorado. Uh, Graham, Graham at GD, G-E-A-N-R-Y, if I'm reading that correctly, tips for finding fall black bears in Colorado. In Colorado. Man, I wish I have, have hunted. I've just never hunted Colorado for fall bears, but I'm assuming it translates. Um, I've hunted them in Montana and Idaho and Washington. Um, kind of the the tips to that is finding the food source, and that tends to be berries, mm-hmm. um, you know, depending on the season. I'm assuming Colorado maybe be it might be a September 1 type. Berries might be starting to fade a little bit, but still locating those areas. Um, you know, most of my history of fall bears, I was allowed to hunt. Washington State allowed us to hunt. Um, it's changed now. It's back to August 1st, but it used to be August 15th that we'd go over and start trying to locate those fall bears. And it was all about that elevation to where the berries were. Like, where were the berries, you know, the most plump, you know, where they have easy access to them, where were the berries in a spot where they're glassable. Because oftentimes we'd find it would be a great berry year, but if we hadn't timed it right, the berries are still down, working their way up, under, you know, uh, below the areas where you could actually glass them up. And that okay. makes for a really tough bear hunt when they're in the timber, right? So if you can time it right and you've found some big berry fields, glassable berry fields, grabbing that good perch that allows you to see in usually berry fields you kind of want to be high above them to look into them uh really hard to look at berry fields from below they just don't grab you much for for glassing into them well it covers them up i was gonna say it covers them up it's deceiving you think it's wide open but they're actually pretty high so you got to be able to see down down in them a little Mm -hmm. bit yeah that was always a trick is trying to get above and looking down on them and boy mark i mean Sometimes you find a real good barrier and you're looking, you're looking at one patch and you're seeing four or five different bears in one big berry patch, you know? So, um, and like I said, I, I think that probably translates to Colorado is finding the food source and, uh, berry fields is, is one that we've always used the most. Yep. I was talking to a buddy of mine and I don't have any personal experience in Colorado either, but he was telling me, um, certain times of year and in the fall i think in and even in some of the low country like river valley type stuff uh finding bears in the choke cherries Mm, yeah true yeah if you're in that type country definitely um whatever that food source is choke cherries is a big one in idaho montana as well you'll find a lot of bears in those in the fall awesome oh boy this i don't know if this is a loaded question or not uh well this is i guess this is probably for me or you uh, why did you leave Washington State, and what do you think about their hunt management? <laughs> oh, man. That's from James. Oh, I left Washington State because of their hunt management. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. No, multiple reasons. Uh, you can go into why you left Washington State. I mean, for me, honestly, I never thought that I would leave the coast. I mean, I love the landscape out there. I mean, from a, from, from a landscape perspective you'd be hard pressed to find a more diverse state. I mean, you've got the ocean, rainforest leading into, you know, kind of that, uh, you know, I don't know, conifer forest, I guess, like, you know, the, uh, you know, clear cuts and blacktails, then transitioning into uh, high mountains, high mountain lakes, then high desert and pine forest. I mean, you, you really definitely ha- yeah. you definitely have it all. You got two species of elk, three species of turkeys, three, three species yeah. of deer. It's got everything. I really. mean, lions, bears, good waterfowl hunting. Uh, 
but I, I left, I guess, for, for work opportunity. Like mm -hmm. I said, I never thought I, I'd leave and got an opportunity at, at Cabela's and was there for a number of years and then got the opportunity at Vortex and, and haven't looked back. And, and uh, you know, through my time at Cabela's and at Vortex, that's when I fell in love with these darn whitetails, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, so that, that was my, <laughs> that was mine. Uh, you know, and, and as far as the hunt management, you know, there's been, you know, I guess that press time, a little bit of a hiccup with the, with the spring bear hunt sitch, but I, I know I rode in and a lot of people rode in and voiced their opinions. So hopefully we're maybe turning the tide on that a little bit, at least appears sounds, to be. Sounds like we're making a difference there with all our emails, right? Yeah. I yeah. Hope. I mean, it's, it's good to see hunters unite a mm -hmm. little bit and, and, uh, you know, fight the good fight. And, you know, as far as their hunt management, I think with a lot of things, um, there's probably some room for improvement, Absolutely. but, uh, you know, I think there's, there's been some good decisions over the years. Um, and then there's been some very bad, but I think everybody's opinionated on what's good and what's bad. Uh, I'm curious, were you there when they made the decision to go three pointer better on mule deer in most units? <sighs> I think I was. Yeah, I must have pretty, been because I left in. Uh, I think I left in two thousand. Yeah. So, I mean, that was a pretty controversial thing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people were very against it um, because you know guys go out and they see a forky, they want to shoot it. But uh, and I I know during that time when they did that, my dad was like, oh, uh, "That's not good." And uh, it didn't take that many years, and all of a sudden, we saw what happened with the muleys and the maturity that they gained and we had giant muleys again like we had some age class to our muleys so you know in the beginning we thought that decision was you know, kind of a rotten deal in the end it was a great decision mm -hmm. and i think it did um justice to a lot of those bucks that just never got an opportunity to get some age to them yeah i think there's there's a lot of benefits to something like that that's hard to see on the front end, right? You know, just like, well, because that's, that's a, it's impacting how you've always hunted. You know, you get an opportunity, you want to be able to take it. You know, don't, don't tell me what deer I can and can't shoot. But, you know, as hunters, I think oftentimes, like, number one, like, I love big bucks as much as the next guy. Yeah. But I think that's also doing things from a biological standpoint, and you're getting a little more balanced age structure of bucks kind of throughout the, you know, the one, two, three, four, five year old bucks versus, you know, cropping a lot of those deer just kind of at that one, two level and not ever getting past it. Yeah. I mean, you know, spikes and forkies don't have many smarts to them at that point. They get killed pretty easily. And, um, there's nothing smarter than an old cagey muley buck. We know that, right, Mark? Yep. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll admit young mule deer are about as dumb as they get. So <laughs> too easy to kill. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, why I left Washington State, like you said, it was hard. It was a tough decision. I mean, I held my wife there hostage for over 20 years <laughs> of marriage, and she wanted to go to Montana where she was raised. We hunt Montana every year. We love going there. It was great. Um, and Washington's a little busy, you know, the coast, traffic, stuff like that. Yeah. And the hunt opportunities in Montana are fantastic really long drawn out seasons um geez like six weeks of bow season and five weeks of rifle season uh everything everything stacked up as uh, montana was just a little bit better for raising our kids mm -hmm. so that's what we wanted to do get a little bit more um kind of uh, just get them out in nature more and we found that there's better opportunity in montana awesome so this will be a good one i like this one this is from uh, Joe Thurston, at J. Thurston. What optics are you rocking for open country mule deer hunting? Oh, I'm curious to your answer, too, because I go back and forth between 10s and 12s all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, it just changes with each trip, it seems like. Uh, like, say, Washington hunting, I never went beyond 10s. It was always, like, 10 by 42s. More open country, big country, Colorado, Nevada type country. Um, I'm bringing the 12 by 50s. Yeah. And that's just a, a perfect, um, perfect everything for me. But those 10 by 42 UHDs are pretty hard to beat, right? Yeah. So I use those probably more than anything um, in a lot of the country I'm hunting, but 12 by 42s and that big stuff. Yeah. And yep. I, I found. Uh, Arizona is one of those places where I use a little bit bigger glass as well. 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I would I would basically be right in line with you on that one. Now, you hunt mule deer a lot more than I do, so I'll speak from this from more of just like an open landscape hunt perspective, coos deer perspective, um, even even high country like alpine bears up in uh, – uh, those 12 by 50s are tough to beat. If you, if you know you're predominantly going to be in open country – and you're going to bring a tripod, which I would say that I would just say that's a necessity. Yeah. Bring a good tripod with a good fluid head and, and, you know, get to your glassing point, keep, you know, get these, those things on a tripod. It's going to be phenomenal. Um, I was chatting with Mike McDowell. He's one of our, our in-house guys at Vortex and he was quoting a study. We were actually doing a podcast the other day where, uh, he had, uh, you know, they'd done the research and essentially when you put a, an optic on a tripod, you you essentially like double its performance. So like if you're using, uh, a t- if you're hand holding a 10 power bino and you add a tripod, you're effectively going to have like a 20 power bino just because of how being steady oh, is yeah. going to, I, I guess, improve your glassing ability. So you do that, you know, with a 12 by 50, man, you got a, a 24 power optic, essentially, you know, from a, from a use perspective, yep. you can do some serious work. And so those, those 12 by 50s, I mean, it's just a good, you know the UHDs or 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 the the original Razor HDs. Those are probably the ones that I'd personally lean to for that type of glassing. You're just going to be able to do some serious work. And then I'd have those that 12 power also, as you know, you can hand hold it too though. Like so, you can keep it in your bino harness, and you've got the stud for your tripod adapter when you want to lock it in. But you need a quick look at something. Bam, you can go do that. You can throw it on the tripod. You're going to have that versatility. I'd probably couple that with a 65 millimeter angled razor spotter and then a razor HD 4000 range finder. And I think you're yeah. off to the raises, man. That's the same system. Um, yeah. Cause on the spotter, you know, it's interesting that 65 goes with me more than anything else, mm-hmm. probably like you. Um, and yet the old 11 to 33 that I've had for so long, man, Washington state or elk hunting. And that's always in the pack. I don't even bring the 65. If I'm bringing a spotter in elk country, it's going to be that, you know, one and a half pound, 11 to 33. Yeah. Things money for, for elk hunting. Yeah. Um, mule deer hunts, uh, coos deer, stuff like that. Yeah. The 65 tends to find its way into the pack, but yeah, no, I, I agree with all that. And that 4,000, that thing's money, money, money. I bring that on my archery hunts. Um, just because even at a distance, uh, the advantage of having that thing where I can reach out, you know, hit something at 2000 yards, you know, Hit, hit the feature, hit the animal, know exactly the distance between the animal and the feature. Um, it's kind of nice to do from a distance. Yeah. So there's a big advantage to having something that really goes out um, that kind of range. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of folks go, oh, I don't, why, why would I ever need 4,000 yards, sure. you know? And number one, it's just going to make it even more effective, faster, more accurate at those closer ranges just because you have that increased capability. But along with that, like you said, your stock planning, your route planning, uh, finding out, the, you know, sometimes it can be deceiving too. You're like, oh, oh yeah. man, you know, how far away is that deer? How close are we going to have to get to a shot or to shoot it? And then you might find out that, man, across that canyon, that's only 600 yards. And, and I've got the rifle and the scope combo and the ballistic data that that's a very doable shot, right? If, if you've practiced, you know. Um, the only other thing I throw in there as like something that I might personally do is, you know, we were talking about long range cartridges and long range shooting. If I was on a hunt where I really thought it was likely that I might get one of those shots, I might transition to a Fury HD AB that has my ballistic data in it. So you laze the target, it's going to give you that ballistic solution, dial that shot, and then in the not so that would be like a 10 power bino that I'd have on my chest, and then I might have the 18 by 56 UHDs like in the top lid of my pack, and that's going to be my primary tripod glassing bino. Right. And then you know then whatever spotter that I went with after that. So. Yep. 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 Yeah, the 18s are great. Um, I I can't say I bring them a ton, but uh, coos deer hunting they never leave the pack. Um, they're wicked important in that giant country where you're looking at tiny tiny deer. Those things are just miniature and um, trying to dig through that oak brush and find those things and pick them out when you just saw one go in there, the 18s are money for that. Yeah, I know uh, we had the, the, the fortunate timing of meeting up for mm-hmm. a day of coos deer hunting two years ago. We did. We were uh, archery coos deer hunting and I was rocking the 12s. I was just burning those things all week long and you had the 18s yep. and I felt like for me... Like I was finding any deer that I wanted to hunt today, 
and with the 18s, you were able to find deer that you were going to hunt tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were looking at mule deer like a day away from yes. us where we were. <laughs> so, which hey, that can be pretty handy, you know, oh, particularly yeah. if maybe you're struggling. You know where you're going the next day, for sure. You got a game plan. Gosh, lots of calibers, man. Lots. Everybody, dude. Everybody loves the cartridge talks, man, and and uh, and I do too. And it's a constant debate. So, what's your what's your all time favorite hunting caliber? Uh, it's probably the three hundred. Yeah, yeah. I I don't know. It comes down to that age old question you get, like, what's the perfect one, or if you only had one. It's such a hard question to, yeah. to answer. But um, how do you beat the old three hundred? Yeah, really. 300, um, 300 short. I mean, just for yeah. ultimate versatility, yeah, those are tough to beat. Yeah, yeah. If I was to pick one and that's all I could hunt with for the rest of my days, it'd be that 300. Yep, get the wisdom. It makes sense. I mean, I don't I don't like to picture that world, but... Uh, yeah, it's ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, okay. What, uh, what, was, what was your most intense hunting trip? Uh, no, we got... Can I, can I got, go out of country? Oh, absolutely. Talk, talk about that? Yeah. Okay. So I was fortunate enough to go on a New Zealand trip uh, a couple years ago um, before all the lockdowns and everything like that. Went over there, intentions on hunting tar. Totally new species. Um, hopefully find a chamois or two as well. And so, um, yeah, I went to the Southern Alps and helicoptered into a spot. Uh, me and a buddy, two buddies. And we started picking apart country, learning it. There was a few Garmin inReach messages to Remy Warren because in the beginning we had no idea what we were doing in that country. Totally new. Um, like were you like, so was that like a, hey, where are these animals living? Or was this like, yeah. how do we? So, so the, be- the big piece of advice that he gave us, because we, you know, we were looking at a crud ton of country. It looked like everything that you would picture a tar would be um you know big giant av shoots uh rocky snowy uh big open areas and we just weren't seeing them like we just weren't seeing the the tar and so remy hit me with a piece of advice it was like head of basin it was head of basin it was real simple like all right now we to get to the head of the basin like we're gonna need to travel this basin goes forever and so we did just that um, put some time in, you know, multiple days on our back, stuff like that, and went for it, head of the basin, got there, started picking apart the top of the uh, the rim, which was, you know, another 1,500 to 2,000 feet up, and we started seeing tar. And it was something so simple, but we just hadn't got up to that point yet. And so that piece of advice helped us out. And I mean, in the t- end, talk we, about, like, narrowing it down, too. Like, like you said, where do you start? Yeah. The basin is huge giant you know it's, it's huge like we're at the bottom end and we're looking at all this amazing country and now we're up you know in the middle you know about a mile and a half two miles in and we're lo- still looking at you know the tops we'd always heard they love the tops the rocks you know the videos you see that's kind of how they where they live but um yeah it wasn't really at that time of year it wasn't until because they were it was during the rut so in june um i think they call it rut for tar I'm not sure something like that and uh, and once we got to that head where it bowled out, the country was nasty, gnarly, really steep. Should have had better gear than we did. Um, it's funny. We went over there with uh, micro spikes instead of full crampons. Okay. Right. So we, uh, we ended up finding animals, um, immediately put a, a tar down, had to go up, try to pluck that tar off the mountain. We got to where it was. It just happened to, you know, I, I shot it. It supermaned off and just dove down into this snowfield. Oh, my gosh. And that darn snowfield had a big, like, 200-foot drop right below it. And that tar stuck in that snow. And we had to get out there and, and um, break it down, basically, with that snowfield just disappearing right below us, you know. And we were very underprepared for that type country. Yeah. Um, it's not often that in the states here hunting mule deer or elk or bear that you need climbing gear and full crampons and all that kind of stuff but we should have had it like we really should have had it but we made you know do with the best we had equipment wise and we ended up you know getting um a few really nice tar ended up in the chamois and 
probably more pucker went into that hunt than any other hunt in my life because of the steepness, uh, frozen snow, deep snow, um, always worrying about start and slide, not being able to stop. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, I would say, you know, very, very, very sketchy place. Um, but it, it was so much fun. And now we're itching to get back there. I mean, it was like death defying steep type country, (laughs) but we're itching to get back there. But, uh, yeah, they they won't really let anybody into New Zealand right now, so we're we're hoping that changes eventually. Yeah, I mean, what you're describing, I, I mean, it sounds sketch even with the quotation mark right equipment. You, you got a better cramp on, maybe you've got like a an ice axe or something like that to self arrest with if you go. Yeah. But you know, I mean, if you go, you, you know, I mean, like we're, that that snow field. I mean, it almost sounds like an avalanche shoot ish. I don't know, like oh, that yeah, does. We, so, yeah, there was a spot, in fact, where we um, took a couple of different bulls uh, on that mountain across, right across from us. And there's avalanches going off all day. Oh, right? naturally. So you're, so you're being really careful um, of your fall line. Like, you're what, you know, making sure that you don't put yourself in a position to, you know, have something come over top of you. And you're also trying to, and it was pretty near impossible to put yourself in a position where if you slip, you're not going off a ledge. Right. You know, that's the goal, but it was never possible in that country. There was always a fall line that wasn't that safe. Like, eh, you know, and these cliffs are really, really huge, big, steep drops. But, um, yeah, I thought about my girls a lot on that trip going to grab these tar because (laughs) 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 it's like, man, that life insurance might just come in handy for my wife on this one. I don't know. Yeah, no, I mean, it sounds awesome. I can see why you're itching to get back. Um, no, I mean, and it's just, it's those hunts like that, you know, they test you, you know, you live to tell the tale, which is awesome. Uh, and I think somehow while you're there, you know, you know that it's probably not the best idea, but somehow when you get back and I haven't really been on, I've been on hunts that are probably more tame than that, but I guess kind of some similar things over, over time, you kind of somehow forget some of that mm. and you want to go back in I know it's crazy right <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's uh like you're itching to get off the mountain because you know you're in a bad spot but then you can't you just can't wait to get back into those positions and um no one of the one of the funnest hunts I've ever done but it was definitely the scariest hunt probably close to the scariest one that I've ever done I I believe it. Uh, yeah, it sounds uh, it sounds very intense, like you said. Um, well, well, it's funny because there's huts in New Zealand, so you can actually sounds weird, but there's huts all over the place. Yeah, and it's we, almost like a like a like a forest service cabin, yeah. public use, first come first serve exactly. type thing. Yeah, yeah, and they're pretty nice. Like they're really well kept. They're not run down or, um, and they do a great job with that system. We had we ran into a couple of guys later in the week. And uh, they were looking up at us with uh, the spotter. And they said, because uh, our buddy, he ended up dinging up his knee. He had to go back down, and he ended up staying at a hut. So it was just me and my buddy up on this mountain now. Okay. So you're, he went you're down, down You're down to two. Okay. Yeah, we're down to two guys. And, and so these guys are all down at a hut, and they happened to be looking up where me and my buddy were. And they said, uh, they, they said to Luke, they're like, oh, those guys look scared. <laughs> because we, I'm sure we were just like, you know, tiptoeing across these big these av shoots with these big, you know, drops below us, just, you know, clenched as as much as we could toe pick in and, and dig our fingernails into these places. Um, yeah, I, we probably did look pretty scared well, from so, a distance. And, and so in that country then, like, you know, you mentioned like, like a, a more, you know, legit, cramp on like what, what were some other things that you're like man i really wish i had that right now the thing that you know might cost you a few hundred bucks right now but you'd pay a few thousand to you know when yep. you're on the hill we should have brought harnesses we should have brought some rope for some of those to be a lot safer okay um, go in tandem and then um so you would have better. like kind of like harnessed in and like maybe lowered yourself down and been able to work from like that secure position yep. let one guy get across um, oh, okay. before sending the other. Yeah. There's a lot of things we could have done, should have done if we'd had the gear. We just didn't have the gear. Yeah. So we were still going one guy across, but, um, 
that wouldn't have helped the guy if you would have slipped on his way across, whereas a you know harness rope would have. So um, a better ice axe than what we had for sure would have been would have been smart. Um, and yeah, those those much better crampons that you know it's like is all these things that I almost brought with me. But when you're traveling that far, um, we probably should have just purchased that stuff when we got there and had it but i just didn't want to pack that much stuff you know um because you have to try to keep your weight down and all that jazz but let me tell you i would have ditched some of the things in my pack to have those things at the time i believe it i believe it got another question here this is uh well this is this is one maybe maybe i'll field this one actually but it's a good it's a really good question uh this guy says uh my kids chat competition what makes you, Vortex, a better company to buy from? This is from Amanda. Anyway, uh, Amanda, so I'd say with Vortex, we have a diverse, a very diverse lineup of competition optics. Now, there's a lot of different types of comp- competition. You've got uh, your multi-gun. You've got, uh, you've got your precision rifle. You've got precision 22 stuff. You've got F-Class. You've got anything under the sun, right? So you might be using anything from, from a red dot sight to a long-range precision fully featured scope to a low power variable. I'd say within all of those categories, we have different tiers of price and quality. And if you're talking kids, right, or out, outfitting multiple kids, that can get pretty expensive. So being able to have a high performing, I'll talk low power variables, a very high performing feature rich optic that's not going to kill you in your pocketbook. So maybe maybe you're even trying to test the waters, you know, it says your kids are talking about competition. So maybe they're not even into it yet. And you don't know if they're going to stick, stick with it, right? Being able for them to dip their toe in with a high quality, high performing optic that doesn't break the bank, I think is a good way to get started. And then, you know, I mean, I would say we, we, we work really hard to build high quality, high performing optics, and we hope you never have an issue. But, you know, the Vortex customer service, if you ever do, no matter what happens, if you run over it with your truck or whatever, something catastrophic happens, I mean, it truly is a lifetime unconditional no fault warranty. I know as a kid, I broke plenty of things. Um, I don't think kids have changed too much. So that's kind of a nice thing to have in your back pocket if you need it. They still break things, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, let's see. Let's see. What's up next? What's up next? Uh, what are the most, the most affordable options when outfitting a family? All right, another family question. Perfect. Um, it says, I, I hunt and have three kids hunting, 16 years to 12 years. Uh, it's getting expensive. Yeah, I bet yeah. it is. Yeah, no kidding. Um, options to try to find ooh, affordability with kids. That's a tough one because it feels like, uh, well, number one, they're always growing. And it, uh, we burn through more boots and clothing every year. Um, yeah, it gets really expensive. I don't know. That's a tough one. I don't, I don't really have a good answer. Hand-me-downs are great, but if you don't know anybody <laughs> that has that, that's a tough question. I mean, what would you say to that? I mean, yeah, it's tough because you want them to have – good enough gear that they have a positive experience, whether that's, you know, a rifle optics, you know, clothing, being comfortable is a huge thing. Good footwear is a huge thing. Um, man, I'd say buy the best you can afford. And I guess the other thing is, you know, possibly as they grow out of, you know, hand it down to your kids. If you have multiple kids, as they grow out of it, you know, there's so many amazing, um, platforms for selling used gear, You you know, you can, Probably, if you buy something that that's actually decent quality, it might it'll likely hold more of its value. You can recoup some of your costs and invest that in you know the next size up as your kids are growing. Yeah, I mean, um, I think boots is a hard one to skimp on. I know we invested in our girls' boots. I got two girls, a six and a thirteen. The thirteen, um, this is year two that she's been hunting, and we haven't put a whole lot of dollars into her clothing. Um, it's whatever we could get, you know, Mm -hmm. used ski gear is what we've been using on those November hunts. It's nothing fancy. It's, it's not a name brand. It's just what it is. Boots though. Um, I think if I'm going to spend anywhere, it's going to be those boots, something that keeps their feet warm, boots and mitts. Uh, those two pieces are the ones to go that I've noticed on my girls. So those are the, those are the things that are going to keep them outside. You start losing your hands and feet. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah, you, you can keep your kids entertained and you can keep them into the game if they got warm feet, 
warm hands, and lots of snacks. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's the secret to success right there. Um, yeah, I, I think you nailed it. And I think you touched on a really big one there, too, though, is a lot of this gear, cold weather gear, outdoor gear, can be dual purpose, right? Those ski pants can be hunting pants, right? So Absolutely. just because it's not in camo doesn't mean you can't hunt in it. For sure. Yeah, and, you know, my girls, when they come with, they're definitely not in camo. They're in, like, you know, uh, solid colored ski pants generally. Yep. And those are those are pretty dang affordable, actually, when you start looking around. Yep, yep. David, uh, David S. Asks, asks, favorite hunting spot in Utah? David, I was going to ask you the same question. <laughs> oh, man, that's a that's a question I don't have an answer to. I've never hunted Utah yet. It's you know, a state I've never drawn. I, I haven't either. And actually, seriously, David, no, I've got a pile of points I need to burn. <laughs> so maybe you could help uh, me out on that one. Yeah, I got a bunch of points, too. I don't feel like that state has any love because I have yet to get pulled out of the hat on that one. But... Um, but no, I'm going to be asking that question once I get drawn too. I know, I know. That's always a tricky one too because you don't want to publicly burn somebody's mm-hmm, spot. Mm-hmm. But uh, okay, okay. Uh, let's see. Jacob Dows, is there? Oh, okay. Is there any limitation on the warranty for the Vortex Razor 4000? And I'll say, no, there's not. I mean, it's our, it's our, it's our. Vortex VIP warranty. It's across the board. It's all of our optics. It's all of our products. No matter whether it does or doesn't have electronics, it's covered by the warranty. If you ever have an issue with it, uh, fire it in back with, uh, to us, and, and we'll get it taken care of. So that's an easy one. All right. And I'd, I'd get your take on this too, Ryan. Uh, what set of binos is the most bang for your buck in the Vortex lineup? Man, um... I mean, I've been running those razors for a while now because I'm I'm old and I've been in the game a while. So I don't know. What would you say to that? You're I mean, the Vortex. Uh, those those will definitely get you some bucks, uh, and they cost a few bucks too, though. So yeah. um, if pe- people know me, I'm indecisive. So I'm going to pick two. I'm going to pick two. I'm going to say the uh, the Diamondback HD or the Viper HD binocular. And I guess you know, ba- I always say bang for the buck, man. It's tough to beat that Diamondback. Um, I know a lot of a lot of folks, a lot of guys. They go, man, I finally got my first good set of binoculars, and it's a Diamondback binocular, oh, yeah. right? Yep. Um, very high performing, very durable, just a solid set of binos. The reason why I bring up the the Viper HD as well is I call that kind of like a it's like an upper mid tier, right? Like it's it's starting to edge into that kind of top tier optic range. Uh, but it doesn't carry that price tag. It's a nice. It's kind of like that very sweet middle ground of price performance, or I'd say that that upper middle ground where you're getting a ton of optical quality, but it's just it's not killing you in your pocketbook like those top tier optics. Right. So, I think you know the Viper HD, Diamondback HD, depending on your budget, I'd sit right in there, and you're getting you're getting a lot of optic for your money, and 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 advancements in in technologies and manufacturing. You know what we're getting today you know, for that $500 mark is astronomically different than what you were getting for that same, like a little, even not that long ago. Right. So, um, ton of performance there. Cool. This is a good one. And, and, and I, I think everybody who's hunting out of state bumps up on this question. This is from Luke Jordan. How do you go about scouting a scouting trip you know maybe it's not i think likely an out-of-state hunt maybe you haven't been to that state before you haven't been to that unit before yeah what does your scouting process look like so scouting um kind of these days it all starts on the computer Mm -hmm. um spend a lot of time looking at multiple different uh mapping systems from google earth to gosh there's a bunch of them now you know onyx is a great one go hunt has some mapping now some good mapping a um, lot of different different places. We've got it pretty easy when it comes to e-scouting. Um, but so I'm, it, it, and again, it always comes back to I'm looking for areas where there's going to be the least amount of traffic. Um, those areas where it's there's going to be some obstacles, some separation, whether that is a distance feature or whether that's a river to be rafted or whether that's just and a real ugly rocky ridge that nobody really wants to get around. Um, Those type things are what just kind of separate you. But, um, you know, when it comes to mule deer, I'm looking for those type. I'm looking for seclusion, 
when it comes to elk, totally different. Um, and I would say looking for areas with f- food cover, shelter, really important when it comes to elk. Um, mule deer, very different in my opinion. But, you know, if I'm going out of state, I'm starting there, I'm building a hunt plan, I'm putting together kind of areas where I think are going to be my top, you know, uh, prospect, and I'm, I'm putting a lot of X's on the map well in advance of me ever getting and stepping foot at that trailhead because there's a lot of things that can change. Like you're looking at your, your Google Earth or whatever, and it all looks good, and it's got all the features you're looking for, and, and then you get there, and there's 30 cars in the parking lot, or there's you know, a hiking trail that's, you know, just packed that, that, at that time, or yeah, horse trailers and all the things that you just don't see on Google earth sometimes. And so you want to have backups and you want to have different elevation areas where, you know, maybe the, the feed is already burned off in that area. So you want to have a secondary place where it's a little lower in elevation. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm putting a dozen different places on a, on, on the map for that unit and then just have an option a, if that doesn't work out, going to B, going to C, instead of trying to figure that out while you're there. So a lot of the scouting is just hoping that this place pans out. If it doesn't, then I'm going to option B. And um, I mean, with the exception of areas where I can get boots on the ground, if I'm just going to a new range and it's within a few hours of my, my house, I'm going to try to get boots on the ground well in advance of that hunt because mm-hmm. there's just no replacement for that. Um, but where, yeah, where it gets a little sketchy, uh, I wouldn't say I'm the greatest e-scouter on the planet. There's guys that are much better at it than me, but is when you get multiple states away and things like that. So um, boots all on the ground are obviously always preferred, but you, you don't always have that luxury. Yeah, I'd say that is that is a benefit or one benefit of – it's it's tough when – well – it's good when you draw that tag of a lifetime, right? Because you're finally hunting a premier unit with hopefully, you know, good populations of, you know, you know, good age class animals, right? But it's also one of those areas where you're not going to hunt year after year after year. So that boots on the ground is only going to pay off for, it could one, one year in your life. So like picking units potentially that you can hunt year after year so you can put that boots on the ground experience to work year after year, you know, there can be advantages you're never gonna there know it too. As well, you know, if you're going in one time, then yeah, you're at a real disadvantage for sure. But yeah, that's a tough one. That is a tough one. I, uh, I used to, in my younger days do a lot more. I'd take my summer and just scout, um, shoot. I even, I even did whitetail tactics, Mark. I put trail cameras on the mountain in places in mule deer country way back in the day and then i kind of got away from that um responsibilities family summertime just don't have that option anymore but one thing i'll mention and i i try to say this um i i know a lot of people don't have 10 days to put together on a hunt when you're if i'm if i'm just talking about mule deer though hunting new areas and out of state hunt i think number one to do that hunt justice if it's a really tough tag is trying to grab those days like do whatever you can work extra hours ahead of time to try to get 10 days to put together because it never fails it's going to take you a few just to dial it in if let's let's say you you did all those things you had 10 days and you're thinking yeah i want to be out there for like the opener like i want to be out there opening day would you would you scout for five days and not prior to the hunt or or maybe two three days prior to the hunt like how would you break down like your hunting versus scouting and like i guess you know the weight that you'd place on both those things that's a good question depending on what was before and after the hunt i uh i would probably if i had the time and let's just let's just pull a state let's say nevada they usually have i guess archery is in august Mm -hmm. um let's say archery august 10th in nevada um you know it's it's very early so those bucks are in summer range you know you you're not really worried about them um shedding their velvet dumping down to that secondary more timbered area so i would probably start on day one i probably wouldn't put in a lot of time before that because i'm going to be scouting as i'm hunting Mm -hmm. and um and then at least if I do happen to see something, I'm able to go after it. Now, in Washington State on that archery hunt, um, those bucks, it seems like within that first week, 
they've either already shaken a lot of that velvet or they're doing that during the first handful of days. And so I would go in a few days ahead of that so that I know exactly what buck I'm going to go for because those bucks, I've seen it on September 7th, 7th, uh, September 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th. Those bucks have already shaken. They've already dropped down a thousand feet and they end up down mid mountain where they're almost impossible to find. Um, Av shoots where it's really difficult to hunt versus more out in the open up on the top above tree line. So in that situation, I would definitely put more weight into the scouting and trying to make my best play with the opportunity that I had for five days. Um, but, and then take that same and, and stretch it out to like, say a rifle hunt in November. Um, if it was a, a tag that gave you the option to get into November, I'd put it all smack dab right in the middle of that rut if possible. Um, because I think that's just going to give you more days with better opportunities. You know, there's nothing like hunting muleys in the rut in November and new bucks are always moving. They're always coming in and, um, you're not really scouting that time of year. But I, when I think of scouting, I'm thinking more for archery hunts early, Mm -hmm. uh, migration hunts, rut hunts. I don't know. I don't, I don't really scout for those at all. I'm just getting myself in the best position and spending the time taking the days and uh, trying, trying to put myself in the best position possible. And those bucks are, are coming to you. It's finding the does. Yeah. 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 That makes a lot of sense. And it's interesting to just hear you break those scenarios down because it's all so hunt specific, right? You really have to start with, okay, what hunt, hunt am I on? You know, is it archery, rifle, muzzleloader? What state I am? Where in the state am I going to be? What time of year? And then, you know, kind of gauging your scouting strategy off that. But I think, like you said, though, I mean, it really all does start with the aerial scouting and then as you know and if you can get boots on the ground or some time before Mm -hmm. perfect but i mean realistically that's not always realistic sure you know yep um okay this is an interesting one what is the most unique game animal you've harvested oh i mean the easy answer would i I would have to say those tar in that chamois i found a really cool chamois in new zealand um those are definitely unique because they're so different than anything we hunt here in the states uh most most of my life has been bear deer elk (laughs) so to have the opportunity to go to new zealand i'd say those two uh the tar and the chamois that i was able to take there were probably the most unique totally totally this is kind of this is more of a i guess this is more of a question for vortex on this one but a good one so definitely want to answer it Candy Vance asks, as part of the lifetime warranty, do you get to have glass cleaned? I have old binos and spotting scope. And I'd say, yeah. If you, if you want us to take a look at those, fire them into us. We'll get them cleaned up. We'll go through them. We'll make sure that they're in proper working order. We'll check, check to make sure that everything is, you know, even stuff that maybe you didn't ask us to look at. We'll probably look at them, just make sure they're in tip-top shape and, and get them back to you. Um, all right, last one, last one, unless we have any live action going on. Can I just uh, send my glass to you then and get them clean so yeah. I don't have to do it? What, did they get, what, did you, <laughs> did you take them outside for a little while? <laughs> They're always dirty after every trip. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I believe that you could probably, uh, we're talking about kids, you know, beating up and breaking stuff. I, I imagine you can be pretty hard on it. Uh, okay, what is, this, this is a good one, and I, I have a feeling we might have the same answer. What is the best scope for hunting? So for me, I guess we may be different because personally, I'm, the backpack style hunts that we do, the 10 day trips, the, you know, many, many miles in it's, it's the weight is a big factor. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, always factoring in ounces and, and with my setup right now, the gun I'm shooting, um, very lightweight comboed with a three to 15 mm-hmm. LHT. Okay. Yep. Um, that's a hard setup to, to go away from because it's ridiculously light and I love that scope. So, uh, and with the rifle I'm shooting comboed with that scope, um, six and a half pounds total combined weight. I mean, that's phenomenal. I mean, you've got an accurate rifle and a rifle scope capable of long range precision work yep. and you're at six and a half pounds. You're not, you're not at any sort of, uh, 
you know, detriment, you no. know, weight detriment for a lightweight, you know, flyweight backpack style setup. I want to say that that three to 15 is what, 18 ounces? I think 17? It's, I think it's, I think it's like, yeah, 18, 19, 18, somewhere in yeah, there. Somewhere yeah. There. Yeah. No. Don't, quote, don't quote me exactly. I don't have the specs. In re- All I know is it's a fully featured top tier long range scope <laughs> that complements any hunting rifle. Yes. Yep. Nope. I've, I've got that on my gun. Um, it's the same scope that I've got on my daughter's gun. Yep. 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 And, th- and that's actually, that's the scope that I was going to pick too, though. I mean, I'd, I'd probably, you know, flutter back and forth between the LHT four and a half to 22 mm. by 50 first focal plane, just because you do get that increased magnification for those longer range shots. But on, um, and, and actually it's not, it's very, I think that's coming in at, I want to say 21.7 ounces, mm-hmm. which is still very that's lightweight. A, it's not a huge hit. No, you know, form factor wise, I mean, you can set those two scopes side by side. You'd be hard pressed to tell a difference, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so you are getting some increased magnification. You're getting the first focal plane. Um, that can be a big asset for some folks. But man, if I was going to pick an all around though, I'd probably pick that three to 15. It's just an extremely versatile magnification range. I actually, I like the second focal plane reticle in, in, in that scope. I like that it goes down to three. Um, you know, four and a half isn't that much different than three. That's why I say I flutter back and forth. Like I could argue it either way. And maybe mm-hmm. tomorrow I might even say something different, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. I think, I think getting down to three is nice. Um, you know, it's just, it's very versatile. Mm-hmm. Like you could be hunting, you could be still hunting some deep woods and, still have a great chance yeah um four and a half isn't much different but yeah there's just a few ounces more and i'm not a real long range shooter and that three to 15 is just perfect for me yeah maybe maybe for somebody else that four and a half to 22 would be perfect you know if if i was like just hunting you know uh southern arizona or something like that i'd I'd go oh yeah four and a half to 22 but for you know if you're asking me for the best all around that three to 15 lht is where it's at yeah i'd agree with that so, yep. Ryan, that's the last one. That's it. I think mm. I think you got off fairly, no more fairly easy. Around here. I think I think that's about it, man. Okay. Um, as always, it's it's always so awesome chatting with you. Your wealth of knowledge. I appreciate answering all these questions. I appreciate answering my question that I snuck in there, and uh, hopefully mm-hmm. we'll see you here on the mountain at some point. No, oh, that'd be great. Love to do it again. So thanks for everything. If you have any other questions for us or Ryan, definitely let us know. Hit us in the comments. We want to answer your questions. It might become a a future podcast topic. We can get Ryan back on. And uh, until next time, happy hunting and shooting, everybody. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.